Ladies and gentlemen, a man who has battled for four hours to make this event, Mr. Sean Adams. Uh, Sean, we're basically going around, everybody's kind of just reflecting on how DIY interfaces with the mainstream from their particular perspective, and we've just been going around the table, so I, I, th I think it's your turn next, Fred, to answer some of those uh, uh, points that were raised. Okay, um, so I guess the, the, the thing I was thinking about is in the case of a major label as, as kind of the uber representative of the mainstream on this panel, for us, it's quite weird because the team that I run is working backwards. We're trying to learn how we can innovate, not only around the services that we offer, but effectively how we can shift ourselves from being a record company to being a service that is of value. So let me try and explain what the hell that actually means. You've got people that make art on one side, and you've got a whole bunch of people who want to find out about that art, listen to it, make love to it, dance to it, do whatever they need to do to it. And the bit in the middle is the bit that has gotten complicated uh, in the post-album or unit age. So let me just run a little experiment here using all of you as, a, as, as an audience to try and explain what, what, what I'm talking about. So I'd just like you to raise your hands. You can raise them multiple times in response to a series of questions, okay? So how many of you listened to a piece of music in the last 24 hours? Okay, that's pretty much everyone. Um, how many of you did so on YouTube? Okay. Uh, Spotify. The radio. A gig. Try to think of another one. SoundCloud. SoundCloud. Thank you. <laughs> on a television program. In an advert. Okay, how many of you bought a piece of music in the last 24 hours? So that's the extent of the problem. But there's two bits of information couched in that exercise. One is the, oh, we're fucked because no one buys any music anymore, which is a concern to a record company, particularly one that has such significant overheads and, you know, I need to be kept in the style to which I've become accustomed. <laughs> um, but there's another issue, which is how I reach or how we, that machinery that sits in the middle between artist and audience, makes a connection. And therefore, the way I speak to you that put your hand up in a certain way, and the way I speak to you that put your hand up in a certain way, and the way I speak to you that didn't put up your hand at all, is a very big challenge. And so for us, actually, looking at how DIY cultures form and, you know, and create themselves, effectively, organically build audiences without any of the machinery, helps us understand how we have to retune the machinery that we actually have so that we're still relevant because the artist piece isn't going away, the uh, audience piece isn't going away, the independent record sector probably isn't going away because it knows how to make a business out of smelling, selling small bits, s small numbers of units to passionate fans. The major label business is in serious trouble. Now, that might fill you all with glee, but it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily, there's a lot of jobs involved, and there is a lot of positive that can come out of, out of this machinery if it's properly run. So interestingly, the team that I run, this thing called the creative group, is effectively about primarily understanding audiences. We're kind of like a sociological experiment. We go up and down the country. We've hired art students from Goldsmith who make documentaries. We go shopping or hang out at people's houses just to see how they consume music, where they put it, how they store it. Does the CD stay in the case? What does their desktop look like? Do they use all of that sort of stuff? Um, and that really helps us a lot. And then we use, if you like, that information to try and create bits of content. So I'll give you an example for a band that you wouldn't think needs any help, ACDC, then I'll be done, which, uh, which were you know, coming back with their seminal classic album, Black Ice, which was basically their return to form uh, after Back in Black, after a few years in the wilderness. And the whole issue for the label was, it's very easy to connect ACDC with its core fan base, because all you have to do is say the record's out, which is great, and in week one a bunch of people go out and buy it, and then a few more people buy it, and then you're done. And the feeling was that maybe there was an opportunity, it's a band that doesn't sell any music digitally, they only sell physical things. The, the album is sacrosanct. They don't do greatest hits. They don't unbundle. They don't do any of that stuff. 
but we felt there was an opportunity to reach kind of lapsed fans, people who were maybe fans of ACDC at one point in their life, very passionate about it, but now they had a kid, a mortgage, recession was just kicking in, were worried about stuff, and so, and possibly worked in a white collar desk job where there was a firewall that didn't let any cool, fun stuff come through. And what we realized was that the way that we could reach them was that there's an arcane programming language inside Excel, which allows you to create programs inside Excel. The Excel goes through the firewall. And so we essentially rendered the, lead, the, the video for Rock and Roll Train, which was the lead single, into this programming language, and then sent, or rather created a website where people downloaded the thing and sent it around. So that was a way of, it, it, and, it, and, it, and, it, and it drove uh, you know, lots of extra, extra sales, as well as lots of engagement with a demographic that hadn't bought a back, uh, an ACDC album in a number of years, and it cost us 300 quid. So it was the ethos of making stuff and a DIY mentality applied back into this shiny machinery. So actually, I think we probably have a lot more to learn from, we need to get more DIY, weirdly, uh, uh, as part of the challenge to stay relevant going forward. So that, that's, my, that's my stall. But then it does, it does sound actually like Sonny actually has that on board. The fact that you have this gig and the fact that you have this, you're the task is they, doing they this. never really knew what I was doing. Um, so you have to talk a good game, create a big smoke screen, so that people go, he's quite smart, but we don't really know what the hell is going on over there. And don't tell anyone until after you've done it. Because the record label way, the major record label way, is some guy, usually in his late 40s, early 50s, saying, this is going to be a fucking smash. And then, like, when it isn't, where did he go? What happened? And really, it's about, let's let it happen. Let's see what happens. The beauty of the world in which we live is information comes back, and it comes back in real time. So put something out that people might actually give a shit about, and then watch what happens. And if they do, harness it, and if they don't, change it. And that's something which is not, shall we say, historically in the major label way. Fred Bolzer. Uh, 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 do you mind if I ask if Sony have just signed The Dancing Dog, actually? The Dancing Dog? Off uh, Britain's Got Talent. We might have. <laughs> <laughs> We're an entertainment company as well. That's so DIY. <laughs> you Gary. should see the fucking dog make things. It's amazing. <laughs> right. Uh, can, can we um, give a big welcome to a man who's had a journey from hell to get here? This is Daniel Martin. Thank you.